Okay. All right, let's uh, get started, please. So we are going to continue talking about rectifier circuits today, and we are seeing half-wave rectifiers by talking about an application. So half-wave rectifiers aren't really suitable for a lot of electronic circuits because the output voltage varies so wildly, right? So just as a very, very brief recap, for our rectifier circuit, our half-wave rectifier circuit, we have something like this. where here is our input voltage as a function of time. Here is our output voltage as a function of time, R, C, and plotted Um, I think I did our input voltage in red. If I'm remembering correctly, it'll be okay if I didn't. We have something like this, where let me explicitly say that this is Vn. And this is VM, right? So as I was saying, we can't really use this for electronic circuits because the voltage that's applied to the electronics, the output voltage, um, isn't constant. And realistically, whenever we're dealing with an electronic circuit, we probably want to have a relatively stable operating point. Uh, but we can use it in a few applications. Um, how many of you guys own a lamp that has two brightness settings? Probably a lot of us. That's actually a half wave rectification. So let's talk about it very briefly. So let's say that we had a simple circuit like this. Here's our AC voltage. And then here we have a switch. So this path will be for bright. And this path down here will be for dim. So our bright path means that we apply all 120 volts RMS across our incandescent bulb. And our dim path would contain our diode such that our diode connected to our bulb, which has some finite internal resistance, looks like a half-wave rectifier. So effectively, Whenever our switch is closed on the dim setting, our bulb is only going to see this output curve, which means that it's getting roughly half its regular amount of power. Now, this might seem like an odd question, but how many of you guys know how an incandescent light bulb works? James. So it is dependent on the current flowing through it, but why don't we see, so let's say that we plug a lamp into an AC outlet. Why doesn't the light flicker? Because the voltage drop across it is always changing. So shouldn't we see it flickering? Yes. There we go. Exactly right. So it's a principle called thermionic emission. So effectively, the hotter you get that tungsten filament, the more light it outputs, right? Um, if you change the voltage drop across it so fast that it never has an opportunity to cool down, it will give you a roughly constant amount of light. 
Well, we're changing it very, very quickly. If we run it through the dim setting, now we're changing it um, and then not doing anything and then changing it over and over again. So it's still changing, but it's only changing half as fast. And we should see that the temperature that it operates at is significantly reduced because it's only getting roughly half of the amount of average power absorbed, which is why it looks significantly dimmer. So that is a practical application um, of half wave rectification. Um, so not all diodes are suitable for use in rectifier circuits, okay? So instead we have to evaluate them on two specific criterion, um, their forward bias current handling capability and their peak inverse voltage capability or PIV capability, okay? So let me write that down really quickly. Meet forward bias current handling capability and peak. Inverse voltage capability. Uh, ability. There we go. All right. So, too much forward bias current. can burn out our diode. Um, and this can cause the diode to either fail open which means it behaves like an open circuit or fail closed, uh, which means it behaves like a short circuit. So effectively, we no longer, if we pass too much forward bias current, the diode no longer acts like a one-way valve. It either lets none of the current flow through forever, or lets all of the current flow through forever, which is defeating the purpose of the diode entirely, right? The diode looks like a one-way valve, um, and so it only lets current flow through intermittently under specific criteria, okay? Um, so the maximum current that our diode will experience for this half wave rectifier is simply the peak value of the AC waveform minus the quantity VD on divided by the resistance value, right? So we can see very easily whether or not this current will exceed or not exceed some criterion established on our data sheet for our device. Um, so this effectively also tells you, like when we were dealing uh, way back in engineering 120, when you connected a resistor in series with your LED to make it blink, this tells you effectively why the resistor needed to be there to begin with. If you didn't have a resistance, this R would effectively be zero. And so 
the maximum current flowing through your diode was sufficient to cause it to burn out. Shined extremely brightly for a split second and then effectively failed open for the remainder of the time. Okay. Now, peak inverse voltage is a little bit uh, less obvious why we need to care about that. Okay. So, I'm looking at my notes here and I'm referencing something called VN not. Um, I'm trying to remember what VN not is because it's literally the only place that it's showing up in my notes. I think that's just the maximum value of the input voltage, but I don't know why I wouldn't have called it just VN max. All right, so let me put it in a slightly different way. If the voltage applied to the diode becomes more negative than our reverse bias breakdown voltage, VBR, the diode will not fully clip the negative half cycle of the input voltage waveform. So effectively, remember that when we get into reverse bias breakdown, um, our diode is capable of passing a lot of current, right? So our IV curve, typically look something like this. Let me label this I and V like so. And then on this side, it should be effectively flat until we hit that reverse bias breakdown voltage, at which point we can start passing a large amount of current. And so this is going to not throw away our negative half cycle for a what did I call the first one? <laughs> I guess our positive half wave rectifier or our negative half wave rectifier. Just trying to use the, the same terms or whatever. Okay. So our peak inverse voltage PIV is V out minus V in maximum which will effectively just be our peak value so typically speaking if we were going to design a rectifier circuit we would want the breakdown voltage of our chosen rectifiers to usually be at least two to three times larger than the peak value of the forward bias that it's ever going to see uh, and we'll see why we want two to three times here in a minute when we're looking at other things to where we're not just going to see a single AC signal on top of this thing. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about um, including a filter to increase the utilization or the usability of a half wave rectifier. Okay. So let's say that we had the following circuit. So we have our simple half wave rectifier. Like so. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put what's called a smoothing capacitor C in parallel with our resistance, effectively creating a filter. So 
So here's our input voltage. V in. Here's our output voltage. V out. And let's plot our waveform. So putting our input voltage in red, like I did earlier today. Something like this. Um, let me define this as time T1. This will be time T2. This will be time T3. And I think that'll be enough time points for us to talk about. Okay. So from zero up to time T1, we effectively have the exact same circuit that we had before, right? So our output voltage in blue is going to follow our input voltage, but it's going to be off by a factor of VDL. Once we hit that time T1, our capacitor has now been fully charged, and so we're going to see that it takes an appreciable amount of time for our capacitor to discharge. And that time is dependent on um, the value of C as well as the value of R because we have a simple RC circuit here, right? So what we should see is that our output voltage falls. Um, so for T1 is less than T is less than T2. As our input voltage falls, so does V out um, because our resistance is providing a discharge path for our capacitance. So let's write this out here. So for, for zero is less than T is less than T1. V out is simply Vn minus Vd on. And then for T1 is less than T is less than T2, we'll find that V out is equal to V peak minus VD on times the exponential of negative T over RC because we have a first order RC circuit. So we're just letting our voltage exponentially decay at T is equal to T2. V out is equal to V in, and so our capacitor is going to start charging again. And then our cycle is just going to repeat itself over and over and over again. And this value, let me put it in green, is what's called our ripple voltage. So the ripple in the output waveform is caused by the capacitor discharging through the resistor while the diode is reverse biased. So our ripple voltage will be equal to the peak value of our input voltage minus VD on divided by RC times the frequency of our input signal. For this circuit, the maximum value of our diode current 
is V peak over R times one plus two pi times the square root of twice V peak over V ripple and our peak inverse voltage will be V out minus V in maximum or twice V peak minus V DL. Why is the peak inverse voltage 2V peak minus VDL? Or approximately. Anybody have any thoughts? V peak is the value of the input voltage at T1. So if we're applying, so actually, let me clarify this very specifically. If we are applying a, let's say, 120 volt RMS signal, um, V peak is 120 times the square root of two, right? So it's not the RMS value. It is the instantaneous value or the, the peak value of the instantaneous voltage that's being applied in our circuit, okay? So don't use the RMS value, multiply the RMS value by square root of two because that will always be the peak value. Okay. So let's say that we had a capacitor large enough to where this line didn't really decay. Okay. Um, and we were looking at a point around right here where our input voltage is at its most negative. Our output voltage would be up here which is exactly, so here's a V peak minus VD on, here's a V peak minus VD on, and then there's a VD on. So that's why it's two V peak minus VD on, because the distance between the blue curve and the red curve is two V peaks minus VD on. Okay. So that's our peak, in, uh, peak inverse voltage. All right, so now let's look at a full wave rectifier circuit. Um, so a half wave rectifier circuit effectively threw away one half cycle of our input signal, right? Um, this full wave rectifier circuit that we're going to look at uh, involves the use of a transformer. So on the input side of things, well, let me write this out. We have our coil. So here's our AC voltage. And then we are going to have a coil over here. Typically speaking, this coil is center tapped. So that we have some voltage here, this will be V in. And then this voltage with respect to ground will be negative V in. So these input voltages are 180 degrees out of phase with each other. I'm going to put a diode on each of these legs. And I'm going to tie the negative polarity terminals of the diodes together. Like so. 
I'm going to jump here. Here's our resistance. And then I'm going to give myself room to put a smoothing capacitor on this guy in a moment as well. So without a capacitor C, our input voltage is in red. We're going to have something like this. And then effectively, the diode on top is going to throw away the negative half cycles so that we'd have something like this. The diode on bottom is going to throw away positive half cycles. so that we'd have something like this. And then these are gonna get added together so that our full output is going to be something like that. Or I imagine that all of these sinusoidal bits were the same height and width. I just can't draw for shit. <laughs> so I'll squeeze it in up here. Hmm. So V out as a function of V in could look something like this. So we're going to have a slope of one on both sides like so. And then this point right here is negative VD on. And this point right here is positive VD on. our maximum current is V peak minus VD on over the resistance. So that's the maximum amount of current carried by either of the two diodes and the peak inverse voltage experienced by either diode is once again going to be twice V peak Minus a VD up, right? So if we look right here, here's our input voltage, here's our output voltage. The difference from here to here is two V peaks, and then we're one VD on below. So that's our maximum reverse bias voltage that either of our diodes will ever see. Yes, Hannah. So VD on, we're using the constant voltage drop diode model here, which is the kind of compromise between the exponential diode model and the ideal diode model. And so that VD on just represents the on voltage for our diode, which I believe I said was around 0 0.3 for germanium, 0 0.7 for silicon, and I think 1.2 for gallium arsenide. So it depends on the material that's used for our diode. Um, but effectively, Using that model, we just say if our input voltage isn't greater than VD on, our diode is an open circuit. And then beyond that point, it's effectively just a battery. So if we throw our capacitor in the mix, our relationships will change a little bit.
So this capacitor C is going to be used to smooth things out. So it's effectively just establishing another simple filter. And so with C, we'll see that Here is the in. Like so. This will be the out. And this difference right here is our ripple voltage. So why do you think we might use a full wave rectifier versus a half wave rectifier with this moving capacitor? The output signal is effectively the same, James. Absolutely right. We need smaller capacitor in order to get effectively the same ripple voltage, uh, which typically means it's going to be cheaper. 100% correct. Our ripple voltage will be literally one half the expression for our ripple voltage for the half wave rectifier. So one half times V peak minus VD on over RC times the frequency of our input signal. Our peak inverse voltage is the same thing. Twice V peak minus VD on and our maximum current uh, sorry, that should have been ID max. Is going to be V peak divided by the resistance times one plus two pi times the square root of V peak over twice V ripple. So this next circuit that we're going to look at is what's called a bridge rectifier. Uh, and so we put our diodes in a Wheatstone bridge configuration. And we use this one whenever we don't want to have the additional cost of having a center tap transform, because that's extra money, because we have to do something to the transform. So our bridge rectifier circuit is just a specialized full wave rectifier. where we have our primary coil here. So here's our AC voltage. This is the input voltage to our diode circuit. I'm going to call this diode D1. This diode D2. This will be diode D3. This will be diode D4. All right, so let me connect this wire like so. This wire down here.
Here's our resistance. This wire is going to jump across the gap. Here's our output voltage, and we will wind up looking at things with a smoothing capacitor in this as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw that in in green. All right, so let's talk our way through how currents are going to flow in this circuit, because it's pretty interesting to me. All right, so let's say that we're on the positive half cycle, which means our input voltage Vn is a positive voltage waveform. Okay. We are going to see current leaving the positive polarity terminal, and then it's going to get to these diodes V1 and V2. One of, them, excuse me, one of them is going to be forward biased. One of them is going to be reverse biased. Which one is going to be forward biased? V2. Absolutely right. So V2 is going to be forward biased. So our current is going to flow. Now we see the negative polarity terminal of this guy. So this is going to be looking like an open circuit. And so our current is going to route itself through our resistor. That resistor current is then going to flow back around like so. Remember that V1 was already established to be off, so this looks like an open circuit still. And so now our current's going to have to come down through this path. V3 was also soon to be off for an open circuit. So now the current flows back to the left. Like so. For our negative half cycle, effectively, our negative polarity terminal is now at a positive voltage. So we're going to have current that's flowing in this direction. It's going to flow through this guy, take the exact same path through here, flow up this away, and then out here. So the output voltage, the voltage drop across our resistor, is going to always be positive because there will never be current flowing from the bottom polarity terminal towards the top. So those diodes work to route the current in such a way that we always see a positive voltage drop across our resistor. So we're going to get the exact same output voltage that we saw for our full wave rectifier, except that now we don't have to deal with that center tap transform and just increase complexity by putting four diodes in instead of two. So without our capacitor, our input voltage is in red, like so. Our output voltage should look something like This, um, let's see. Our maximum diode current is going to be V peak minus twice VD on divided by R because our current flows through two diodes. So we're going to have two diode voltage drops to take into account. Our peak inverse voltage is 
the output voltage minus the input voltage at its maximum, um, which is going to look like V out plus VD2 forward or V peak minus twice VD on plus one VD on or just V peak minus VD on or following our current around one half of our path. So another advantage here is that the individual diode sees a significantly smaller peak inverse voltage so that we don't have to use more costly diodes to use this. With our smoothing capacitor included, Here's our input. Here's our ripple. And we can say that our ripple voltage is one half V peak minus twice VD on over RC times the frequency of our input signal. Our peak inverse voltage is just going to be V peak minus VD on and our maximum current. V peak over R, 1 plus 2 pi times the square root of V peak over twice V root. All right, so those are all of our rectifier circuits. Um, on your design project, which I have not yet uploaded, but I will be uploading either today or tomorrow so that you guys have the entire break to not do it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys to choose to design two different circuits. So let me let me um, take a moment back here. So I believe I told you guys that um, for this design project in this class, you get to work in groups, which is true. Um, my preference would be groups of three because that means that's less crap for me to have to grade. Um, I definitely understand that some people may only want to work in two person teams and some people may want to work by themselves. And I'm willing to allow all of those variations. So a group of one to three people, um, you are gonna be asked to complete two of the six design prompts. Okay. Um, so I want you to be aware So there's gonna be like two rectifier circuits, two diode logic circuits, and two others that I can't remember off the top of my head because it's been two years since I taught this class. Um, you can't choose both of the rectifier circuits or both of the diode logic circuits. It needs to be two different circuit things. Okay, so I'll make sure that we All right, so yes. Really hundred percent, yeah. So this might step down 120 volts to maybe eight volts or something like that. Eight volts peak or something, yeah. Um, and then attached onto the end of this thing might be like a five volt voltage regulator or something like that. So like that little, the little white box that comes with your phone that you plug your USB cable into literally has the transformer, the diode bridge as an IC instead of four discrete diodes, it's four diodes on a single tip. Um, the filter, as well as a zener diode voltage regulator all in one small package. Yeah, yeah, but that transformer is literally to step our 120 volt AC signal down 
to something that's closer to the five volts or whatever that we want at the output to supply our USB port. Yes. All right, so when we're following the red current right here, we see the positive. So we have a positive voltage with respect to ground, which is literally labeled nowhere on this circuit. So ground is just floating point out in space. Uh, but we have a positive polarity voltage with respect to ground. And then we see the negative polarity terminal, the diode D1, or the positive polarity terminal of diode D2. So D2 is the one that's going to be on because D1 is very obviously reverse bias because we have this is a positive voltage. So this point is lower in electric potential. So this is off. So this looks like an open circuit, right? So all of our current flows through D2, which was forward biased. Then we have another case to where we see the negative polarity terminal, but we still have some positive voltage. So this one is also off. So our diode current routes down here, flows through this resistor, comes up here. Now it sees this point. If this diode was already off, it's off, which means it's still an open circuit. So our current has to wrap around and flow this way and then out here. And then for the green path, it's literally the exact same thing, except that now we're considering the negative half cycle where this point is higher in electric potential than this point. Yes. You could if you wanted to, um, but I'm thinking in terms of applications here specifically, right? So full wave rectifiers are what are used either the full wave or the bridge rectifier or what are used to power electronic circuits where we don't particularly want a large variation on our output voltage. We're gonna, like I said, we have this smoothing capacitor here to make things a little better. We're probably gonna run this into a voltage regulator to make our output look like a pretty damn close to strict DC circuit. Whereas a half wave rectifier isn't used in those applications. So we might use a step down transformer to put our input voltage as something smaller, but that means that we're gonna get even less power delivered to whatever our load happens to be. These are designed specifically for converting AC voltages like our electricity is distributed down to low level DC voltages, 3.3 volts, five volts, things like that to power our electronic devices like televisions, phones, and all that kind of good stuff. So there's nothing preventing us from throwing a transformer on the front side of a half-wave rectifier, but there's not really an application that requires. Yes, Mason. Up to today. And if I don't hurry the hell up and talk about diode logic circuits, a very small amount of what we're covering on the day we get back. So a draft of it is already up over the break when I make the test and figure out what you need. Yeah. But uh, yes, I will post a final version of the equation sheet once I finish making the test and figure out what needs to be on there for sure. All right, diode logic circuits. This shouldn't take a whole hell of a long time. That being said, I always somehow manage to get these things backward in my head. So bear with me. All right, so let's start with a simple diode OR gate. So we'll have two input voltages, VA and VB. And so this will be diode A.
and this will be diode B. And the negative polarity terminals of these two diodes are tied together, like so. And then we're going to place some resistance here as our path to ground. And our output voltage with respect to ground will be measured at this term. So it's effectively just the voltage drop across the resistor. So let's make a little table here. Here's VA. Here's VB. Here's V out. So let's start with VA is zero volts and VB is zero volts. So when VA is zero volts and VB is zero volts, both of these diodes are reverse bias. Which means there will be no current flowing through either diode, so no current flowing through our resistor, which means V out is tied directly to ground. So if both VA and VB are zero, V out is zero volts. From a logic perspective, we have an input of zero, another input of zero, and an output of zero, okay? Now let's say that VA is zero volts and VB is five volts. Since VB is five volts, this diode is capable of conducting current. So we will see some current flowing down to our resistor, and so our voltage drop will be I times R, not zero volts. So let's just say for the sake of argument that it's going to be approximately five volts. Realistically, it would be five volts minus VD on, but I don't want to care about that. It's going to look like a high logic state. Okay. If VA is five volts and VB is zero volts, we have the exact same situation, except that the diode on top is the one that's carrying the current. So our output should look like five volts. And if both of our inputs are five volts, you're definitely going to have some current going through a resistor. And so therefore the voltage drop should be about five volts as well. So effectively, they're going to share the current load. So if either of our inputs are on, our output is high. So this is an OR gate. Now let's look at an AND gate. It is practically the exact same thing, except flipped upside down. So we have a five volt supply voltage. Here's our resistor R. Sorry, this should be DA. DA. Here's our output voltage. Make our little table again. So when VA and VB are both zero, both of our diodes are forward biased. So 
both of these diodes will be on and able to conduct current, um, which means our output voltage will be one VD on above ground, effectively, which is going to be approximately zero. Sorry, this will be five. All right. So now let's say that the A is zero from DD is five volts. Well, if DD is five volts, then this guy is reverse biased, or effectively actually doesn't have any bias voltage across it at all, which means it's still going to act by an open circuit because it's not stored. So this guy is an open circuit, but this guy is still forward bias, which means our output is effectively tied to this ground again. With VA at five volts and VB at zero volts, it's the exact same situation, except that the other diode is the one that's open circuited. They're both at five volts, they're both open circuits, and there's no conducting path to ground, which means there's no voltage drop across our resistor, and so V out is at exactly five volts. So it requires both of our input signals, VA and VB, to be high for our output to go high. All right, I'm done. Merry Christmas. I hope you guys have a safe and happy break. Uh, nobody get arrested or anything fun like that. No. Yeah, I know. I'm such a jerk. Yes. So for diodes, we literally can't do anything beyond simple and an or. Literally, there, there's a couple of reasons. Like you could cascode an and into an or or an or into an and and stuff like that. But you're going to run out of headroom pretty quickly because every diode has a voltage drop that you need to account for as well. So two stages maximum would be the most you could ever really do with diodes, which is why they're not really used as logic circuits a whole hell of a lot. Grayson. No, I don't know what that means. So no. <laughs> it's been, oh uh, gosh, let's see. When I took digital design, it was probably 2007. So 16 years since I've done digital design stuff, I remember what the K-map is. Couldn't tell you how to do it or whatever, a whole hell of a lot, but yeah. Um, when we get to transistors, we'll do a couple of small logic gates with those as well. Um, but most of most of our focus in this class is going to be on the analog side of things and not really the digital side of things. So I I, I understand you know that they are used in that space, but that's not what we're particularly caring about in this class. We're going to talk about amplifiers because that's fun and digital logic is boring in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, 